Good morning and welcome to Food for Thought for Wednesday, January the 27th, 2021. My name is Pastor Clint Lang with Hillside Community Church in 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. Glad you could join me this morning. We're continuing on in the book of James with uh, just some thoughts about uh, this particular book and we've reached chapter 3. So um, yeah, we're going to speak a little bit about some of the first few verses in chapter 3. Um, I've heard it. I've heard someone come up to me and say that they really desired to be a, a, a teacher, a Christian teacher. And um, man, this is a great aspiration because being a teacher can can really help people understand God's word, help them in their walk with Christ, and also really have a positive influence on the Christian community and also the world around them if they're if they're doing what is right and and following after God in the process. But uh, James starts chapter 3 with a sober ad- admonition for those who would seek to become teachers in the church. Um, J- James writes in verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now the reality of it is that teachers must take their responsibilities seriously because their accountability is greater before God. Um, and they will receive a stricter judgment. So it's not as though um, one should stay away from teaching. Uh, the rewards of good teaching and good teachers are great. Um, but it is not easy to be a teacher. Um, for those who go into teaching, we need to really be prepared to be evaluated with a higher standard than our pupils. And James continues saying, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, along the line of the context of people that are presuming that they'd like to be teachers, uh, commentator David Guzik puts it this way. He says that, the greater accountability of teachers is especially sobering in light of our common weaknesses. Um, Just because a person becomes a teacher does not mean that you're going to be exempted from uh, temptations that are common to man. There will be no less temptation to you than to anyone else. Um, The sin nature in all people leads us to wrong thinking. And if we allow wrong thinking to take root in us, then it's not long before the wrong thinking turns into sinful behavior, wrong actions. And um, we stumble as human beings in many ways. And the ancient Greek word stumble does not imply a fatal fall, but it does say something uh, to the nature of someone tripping up and hindering their progress by their tripping in their advancement in the knowledge of the Lord. So James includes himself uh, with everyone else among those who stumble. He says we all stumble in many ways. But, but he doesn't excuse his or anyone else's stumbling. We all... Uh, stumble at times, but we should all press on to be better um, walking with the Lord, uh, marked with less stumbling. Now, James gets down to the nitty-gritty here. He says that anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. Well, as we all stumble from time to time, nobody has mastered this. Um, there's times when um, we don't say what's right. I know that I'm imperfect in that way. I'm a teacher in the church, and sometimes I say the wrong things. I pray that I don't do it often, but there are times when um, when I do, and I need to have a penitent heart about that and, and be humble about that, and I pray that my tongue would be better kept in check. And, you know, maybe you're in the same boat. You you know, for the most part, you can keep 
your tongue in check, but there's times where things happen that you lose control of that tongue. Well, there is there is grace for you today, my friend. But uh, you know the the passage here speaks in a way that uh, provides a measure for spiritual maturity. So James is calling us to evaluate where we are. And if we find that we lack spiritual maturity because we can't control our speech, we need to repent of this and ask God to help us to, uh, to steer our being by keeping a tight rein on our tongues. Now, James begins to give several practical examples of what he means with this. In verses 3 to 6, we read... When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. I remember when I was a young lad, I rode this Arabian horse. His name was El Dorado. And uh, El Dorado was a fine horse. He was a beautiful horse. But he was a stubborn horse. And even though I was riding him and the, and the bit was in his mouth, it was absolutely everything I could do to keep that horse from getting away on me. And, uh, you know, because of his exuberance and uh, probably his um, perception that I was a young rider, he uh, really wanted to do his own thing and he didn't want to listen to the bit that was placed in his mouth. So sometimes we're like uh, those exuberant horses where we don't like having a check put on our tongue. But if we yield to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to put a check, a bit in our mouth, uh, He will steer us. And if we are not stubborn, trying to go our own way, we can. He, the whole person will be steered as God steers us. Um, with the bit in our mouth. And um, I know that's a, a strange illustration, but it kind of proves a point that our tongue, uh, if it's under control of the Holy Spirit, will steer us into paths of righteousness. Where if our tongue's unbridled, that our tongue uh, will kind of run and, uh, and point in the direction that uh, our flesh wants to go, then our whole body will be out of sync with the Spirit and we'll be constantly struggling over areas of sin in our lives. Like the ship, right? You know, you've all seen the videos where there's a giant ship that's navigating through, you know, like a canal or whatever. And the, the pilot steers it and the, the, the small rudder steers the entire boat through the the small obstacles that are in the way. And that's kind of like yielding to the Spirit, yielding our tongue to the Spirit will steer our body in the way that God desires us to go. And we won't be wrecked on the rocks. But you all have seen ships that uh, maybe the the uh, navigator wasn't paying attention or something like that and uh, the rudder wasn't steered properly, and that ship gets shipwrecked. Um, James continues, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but makes great boasts. Consider what a great fire, forest fire is set on fire by a small spark. Well, being in 100 Mile, we all understand that one. I mean, if you play around with matches or you play around with fire, and you don't respect the power of it, um, you'll find very soon that uh, it could get away on you. And uh, look at the damage caused by just a small fire, about carelessness of the small fire. Carelessness with our tongue. If we don't have that tongue yielded to the Holy Spirit and kept in check, the damage can be huge. Like just a small thing coming out of our mouth can ruin relationships for years. And it takes years and years for relationships to regrow that have been damaged by careless words. 
So, you know, this is this is the analogy that James is uh, is speaking, and he says the tongue is also fire, a world of evil amongst parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Well, I would say that the fruit of our lips, if it's controlled by the sin nature, is set ablaze by hell itself. It's evil. It's amazing. You know, you can be walking closely with God at one moment, and the next moment you get angry, and all of a sudden you lose control over your tongue, and before you know it, you've done terrible damage to the people you love or the people that are around you and everything like that. So you can just see in your sin nature, there's nothing good there. It comes from uh, you know, the same source as hell. You know, it's rebellion against God. It's enmity against God. But the life controlled by the Spirit, uh, if your tongue is controlled by the Spirit, then freshness flows from the the mouth. So now I I would say that as Christians, right, we um, we're saved by grace. We know that none of us deserve to be forgiven, but God forgives us. But He does want us to yield to Him. You see, we have choices to make, and correspondingly, the choices that we make will determine our closeness to Him and our effectiveness for His kingdom purposes. So. You know, we need to be uh, diligent, watchful, prayerful. Our enemy is out there trying to tempt us to to go astray. And our flesh is out there tempting us to go astray. The world is out there encouraging us to go astray, but we need to stay on the course. So, you know, um, the tongue needs to be one of the first things that uh, that we... That we uh, we need to yield to the Spirit with. I mean, all of our body needs to be yielded to the Spirit, but the tongue sets the course in many cases. So, with the tongue, it says in verse 9, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. God hates division. He hates gossip, backbiting, and devouring other people's character behind their back. This is not right. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, says James. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. No, this should not be. So, if I'm guilty of this, if I have a hard time with this, God, have mercy on us. We need your grace to speak in a way that is pleasing to you and to resist the temptation to make ourselves look better at the expense of other people. I know that this is not easy and that all of us probably need to evaluate our lives, and uh, I pray that, that we will. Um, this is a very sobering scripture. Um, we need to uh, yield to the Holy Spirit of God. This is food for thought.